If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So what'd you guys think? I thought it was great. Wow. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. The story behind... So you're going to hear us interview Bishop Barron, who's a actual bishop. He's a Catholic bishop that is using new media, YouTube and social media, Facebook and Instagram. That was our first church podcast. I yeah, want to point and, that out. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I found him a while ago and I thought he was so compelling. And people who listen to the podcast know that I'm not necessarily religious. I know Adam and Justin are both. Necessarily? You oh, couldn't have been further from that about three years so ago. We're so religious, bro. <laughs> but, well, you know what I mean. And, Insane. But, but I found him on, on uh, YouTube and watched his videos and he was so compelling in the way he communicated uh, you know, his ideas was so well done that uh, I was intrigued and I watched all of it. I watched so much of his stuff. I watched this whole series, his Catholicism mm -hmm. series on Amazon Prime. I watched his videos on YouTube and I'm like, I got to I got to get this person on our show because he's a really good communicator. He's very, very good. Uh, and he doesn't shy away from hard uh, questions at all. I also think it's yeah. only fair that we kind of went this direction too. I feel like we've, you know, there was a while there where we were on this interviewing all these, you know, spiritually righteous people and the ayahuasca chasers. And I feel like we haven't done anything on the opposite side. I mean, we, right. we, we talk to a lot of people that uh, don't believe in God and we haven't really spoke to a really, really intelligent person that can articulate their point of view like he can. Well, we, we you know, total health encompasses, we talk a lot about the physical part of health and nutrition uh, but there's another side of health, and that's spiritual health, and that is, you can't have total health without spiritual health. You just can't. It's it's a it's a part. It make it's a part of what makes us human, and it's a part. It's something that we seek out. And uh, Bishop Barron talks about that a little bit in this episode as well. And we asked yeah. him some tough questions, and we asked him stuff about the church. It was a really really good time. We went up to we went down to Santa Barbara to visit him at the Mission Santa Barbara. Gosh, tell me how much you guys love it down Man. there. Gorgeous, gorgeous, so nice, gorgeous. And uh, Father Steve, who works with him, is such a great guy. He's jacked. He's he lifts. All, he's all buffed. I'm like, what's yeah. going on here? Yeah. He works out. He lifts weights. And uh, another guy on their team, Joe, forgot his last name. Mm. I, apparently, he's like a strong man. Uh, yeah. Apparently, another dude that lifts weights. So they're all into fitness. So it was really, really cool. Yeah. So we had a great time. We hope you enjoy uh, this episode. We we had a great time talking to him. We could only talk to him for about an hour and, and 20 minutes or so, but I, yeah. I swear I could have sat down and talked to him for Oh, we squeezed everything we possibly could. Oh. Like, all, every question I could possibly think of, we were trying to get in there. I, yeah. I tell you what, if you if you want to explore spirituality, okay, you don't have to be Christian, you have to be whatever, Bishop Barron is a great representative of the of the Christian uh, you know, faith. He does a, such a good job. Find him on YouTube. It's Bishop Robert Barron. His videos are amazing. He has well, he does he does an incredible job of distilling the information that I think uh, a lot of people just stay away from. Right? Like he'll take a really extremely difficult topic to address, and we went there today with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, we definitely yeah. uh, touched on some you know touchy subjects that I think a lot of people that I've asked in his position, and they kind of just stray away from it where mm -hmm. I felt like he not only answered it, but then he also distilled it in a way that the average person can can understand and digest it. That's he, what I really enjoy. What's unique about him is he's using new media to, you know, what they would say evangelize, right? To get mm -hmm. things, you know, to be able to get their word out. And the church uh, hasn't done a good job of that in the past, but he's doing a very, very good job of it. And so I, I find it absolutely <clears throat> fascinating the way he's doing it. So uh, YouTube is where I found him. Mm -hmm. You'll find all his videos on there. So it's Bishop Robert and then Baron is with two R's, B-A-R-R-O-N. Um, you can find him on Instagram and Twitter at Bishop Baron. Uh, you can find him on Facebook at Bishop Robert Baron. And then their website is wordonfire.org. And he's got all these series that you could you could pay for on Amazon Prime. I highly recommend them. You know, again, I watch them to educate yeah. myself. And they were very, very good, very compelling, very yeah, well made. Che definitely check out some of his YouTubes. I mean, they're very compelling. And this is the first podcast. I don't think we had one swear word. <laughs> that's, that's so true. <laughs> Can I tell it you was how? like crazy. So it didn't make it on air, but Sal was in the bathroom and we were sitting there and we we're talking to uh, the other father, right? Father Steve. Yeah, Father Steve. And 
he was talking about how they were really hesitant to do the interview because we've been coined as the Howard Stern of fitness. Mm. And I was kind of explaining that our raw approach, the kind of shock and awe, and we absolutely swear and do things like that. And I said, but I think, uh, I think the podcast has come full circle. I think that we still are that way, but we don't, uh, I think we used to default to that out of just plain old nerves when we yeah. first started. Nervous humor. <laughs> and I was trying to say that, and I was heading to say dick jokes. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but you, you, even, <laughs> you didn't say dick. I couldn't say dick, and then <laughs> penis joke sounds weird. And so uh, I was like lost for words for a minute there. It was really funny. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, unfortunately, didn't make it on air. It's the environment, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but cleaned they, us up. They, they were awesome. Great, great people to talk to. This is a great interview. We had a lot of fun, so we hope you enjoy it. Um, also, uh, let's see, this airs tomorrow, Doug. Is this, what's the date tomorrow? Is this the... You, you should also warn, because uh, I know that they're going to be putting this out to their audience, right? So they're going right. to be out to their, he has a huge mailing list. He has a huge following on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. And I think we should warn his audience that's coming over to listen to our show right now that this is for sure the cleanest version yeah. of mind pump you know we definitely uh if you if you are offended by swear we're, we're, words, a, we're a comedy and fitness show fitness and health show um and so we go all over the place so yeah. you know, you'll check it out and see if you like it it's a good time we have a good time. we're good guys i <laughs> Just promise be open-minded you've yeah. been warned you know, yeah, we, we were open-minded with this yeah so now go. now this is going to be dropping uh the first of august we have a new promotion so last month's promotion was so successful that this month now we're going to come out with another one maps performance i am so excited about this 50 percent off we've never done a, a mass performance 50 percent off no, sale never. ever so this is massive now mass performance is functional fitness training so if you're bored with your traditional bodybuilding type exercises or traditional barbell and dumbbell type workouts mass performance is a phenomenal program a uh, lot of emphasis on mobility on the program. It was the first MAPS program that Adam, Justin, and myself wrote together. So this is all of our minds put together on this program. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent program, especially if you want to change it up, switch it up, or if you're the kind of person that likes to move as well as you look. You want to look good, but you also want to be able to move good, not just have those gym muscles. Again, it's 50% off. You have to use the code GREEN. 50, all one word, no space, green50 at checkout. This is at mindpumpmedia.com. So without any further ado, here we are interviewing Bishop Barron. Enjoy. Enjoy. I've found you. Um, so I, I, was on my, I was on my own kind of journey, and I was atheist for a long time. And, you know, through my own reading or whatever learning, I, I became more agnostic and then recently found Jordan Peterson and was listening to his talks and was absolutely blown away by some of the stuff he said. And then I found a video where you were talking about Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. And I thought the way you communicated yourself was was brilliant. And so it, I kind of went down this rabbit hole of your videos yeah. and your content. There's a lot of your videos. Uh, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I had never heard anybody uh, do what you do as well as you do using new media. I don't think, I don't know any, anybody from the, the Catholic Church that's really doing it that way, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and you're also not afraid to tackle all the hard all the hard stuff and pop culture. And uh, how did you get into using new media to to I guess evangelize? Yeah, you know, I was a teacher for a long time at the seminary, so I taught courses in theology, and I was a writer, so I wrote books and articles, and I was a, a speaker as well. I'd go around the country giving talks, you know, to groups of of priests or groups of lay people, and all that, but around the end of, of the last century, I guess, like the late 90s, <laughs> uh, it began to occur to me, you know, we could do so much more if we could start using, at that time, you know, the, the older media of radio, TV, and all that, but then soon after, the explosion of the new media happened. And so I just thought, I mean, why not? Why wouldn't you use it if you could? You're right, very few were doing it. It just wasn't a, a thing in the Catholic uh, space. But I just sort of launched into it. We first got into radio, uh, I was on radio in Chicago with a sermon show at at five fifteen on Sunday morning. So that's how I started. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> the early a, risers. Well, a surprising audience, I must say. I, I'd get uh, like truckers writing to me and say that they heard the sermon as they're going through Chicago at five o'clock in the morning. So we started there and then branched out to uh, you know some video things and all that. But I think when the social media stuff really hit, so YouTube was invented, I think, it was in two thousand six. By February two thousand seven. 
we started the YouTube wow. channel. Oh, wow. And it just struck me and, you know, people around me that, boy, wouldn't this be a useful tool uh, if I just get on there? And, and then my instinct was don't begin so much with religion and theology, but begin with yeah. the culture and then find points of contact. So my very first one, February 2007, was um, The Departed, the movie by Scorsese, you know, and with uh, Jack Nicholson and all those. And I'd just seen it. And I thought, well, I'll do something with that. I'll just talk about the role of, of evil and sin and grace. Because, you know, Scorsese is, is, you know, a Catholic after a manner of speaking. And, and there's a lot of Catholic elements in his movies. So that's how we started and uh, took it from there. I, I had no idea when I started who would watch, if anyone would. We had a little bit of money to make these things. And uh, I said, well, let's try it. The foresight was brilliant, especially back then. I mean, if, if, if I wish I knew YouTube could get on YouTube in 2007, by now my business would be yeah. massive. So, I mean, did I forget, you feel called to it? Or? Yeah, I guess so. I, I put it that way. I think it was a, a call. Um, to me, it just seems obvious. I mean, why wouldn't you use these tools? Hmm. Everyone and his brother will say, oh, well, you know, there's all this uh, negativity with it and, you know, individualism and, and there's mm -hmm. pornography and blah. Well, yeah, okay. But I mean, that's true of movies and TV and everything else. I mean, right. any form of communication you use. So I just thought, you know, why not do the glass half full approach and say, you know, uh, all the evangelists over the centuries have used the tools available to them. And here's ones that we have that, frankly, they would have given their right arm for. I mean, mm -hmm. they have the, the access. I remember it first struck me early on when we did a YouTube video and, and I'd suddenly get an email from um, a, a sailor on a, a naval ship in the South China Sea. <laughs> God, I mean, how did right. he find this video? Yeah, how but, cool is that? Yeah, because then you realize 24-7 all over the world, these things are now available. And then you just you gradually build up the audience. And a lot of the audience building came from the comments. And, and it, in the beginning, I didn't know you could make comments on oh. YouTube. I, honestly, oh. I didn't know. I thought, oh, the trolls are terrible. Oh. The no, but, but, but I, and I discovered that quickly. You know, and, and at first, yeah. I was kind of like flummoxed. I was shocked. Oh, my God. Because you know, 95% of people that come on the com boxes are there to criticize you. And, oh, you know, yeah. sure. and especially religion. Ruthlessly. Yeah. And you're talking about religion. I mean, come on. So it's just a recipe for a lot of uh, negativity. But... Once I got over that, I thought, oh, okay, okay, that's the game we're playing here. I can at least get some traction. There's some opportunity there. Right. right. And and then I'd say to, to people who on, on my in my world would say, why, you know, why are you bothering with this? It's just these crazy people and you know, these and who's watching these videos and you have all these trolls, you know, coming. I said, No, no, no. Uh, I can get at least a little traction with people who would never, ever come to any of our institutions. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I'm finding people out here. Trust me, they're not coming to our parish programs. They're not coming to Mass on Sunday. So I got some traction. Mm. Now, some of the real troll types, you know, you can't really engage. But there were a surprising, I found, a surprising number of people that you could engage. Mm -hmm. And they might begin very aggressively. They hate God. They hate religion. They hate me or whatever. Well, I hate priests. But I might have a, enough to work with where I can say, yeah, but let me just respond to that. Oh, all right, I'll come back. Okay, okay. Now let me respond to that. And in the, in the early years, I have less time for it now, but in the early years when I could really follow these things, sometimes these really long, interesting exchanges happen. Then I found people would write to me and say, you know, that, uh, they never got on here, but they they were reading them, mm -hmm. and they say, "Oh, I, I read that long exchange you had." And I'm thinking, like, really, you did? Because you just start thinking, "Oh no, I'm just dialoguing with this one guy." No, but no, now you're dialoguing with all kinds of people. So that just convinced me increasingly this is worth doing. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning to the present day, I've got people trust me on, on the church side to think this is, you know, it's a trivialization or it's mm -hmm. a waste of time and. But I've never bought that. I, I think there's just so much good that comes out of it. Why do you think there's the, that kind of reluctance? Because it reminds me of like the original or I guess one of the oldest examples of this kind of technology where you're getting the word out, which was the printing press. Yeah. And I feel like there was even resistance when the printing sure press was, was invented from the church. Yeah. And now there may be a little resistance with technology. Why do you think that is? Because, and that's a good example actually, because when the printing press was going on, people thought the same thing. Like, oh, pop, superficial, everyone's going to read it. Oh, we can't have that. Yeah. Because they were used to communicating within a very small uh, world. And then, of course, I get that. That's the whole academic culture and so on. So it's a good comparison with the printing press. Is that it really 
popularized and democratized mm-hmm. communication. Now, I mean, a fortiori with with the social media, we got this huge capacity to reach out to everybody. So that's the danger. And you know, serious minded Catholics would say, some of them would say, you're going to trivialize, you're going to flatten things out. But see, I my wager has been, and I I think it's valid that you can do it in a way that's not trivializing. So. My, my YouTube work, um, I've always tried to make it substantive. It's not you know, a treatise of 25 pages. It's not a book. But I think at the same time, it's not uh, superficial. It's not trivial. I'm trying to do it seriously, but in short enough compass and in an attractive enough way that people will watch. And I think that's been proven to be true, you know, 32 million views later. Yeah. So um, uh, that was a wager I made a long time ago, and I think it's paid off. I think mm-hmm. you're right. You Absolutely. got my attention for sure, which yeah. never would have I ever approached or talked to a bishop to have on my podcast or talk about these things had I not seen you yeah. and the way you communicate things. It just wouldn't would have never happened. Yeah, good. No, and I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. And I've heard that from a lot of people over the years, and it confirms me. And I'd say now, though, honestly, I think the church has largely come around to mm-hmm. seeing that's a good thing. You know, my, my bishop colleagues, when we get together, uh, they're almost to a person I mean very supportive and very interested and grateful for it and you know also keep in mind that I started doing all this stuff right in the teeth of the first wave of the sex abuse scandal so mm. that's 2002 oh, I didn't even think right about that. Mm-hmm. and so we start the YouTube stuff 2000 what seven started doing my Catholicism series we started filming that 2008 um, so it's it's and the new atheists have appeared. By this time, so they're right after September 11th. Mm-hmm. So you get Hitchens, Dawkins, Sam Harris, and company are all appearing after 2001. So that's when I started kind of launching into this world. So it, it, it wasn't, in a way, the most propitious moment. I mean, it was a little kind of a dicey time. But my conviction was, no, no, get a priest into that space, you know. Very early on, there was a, we had a, a guy who was doing some consultation, and he said, uh, hey, Father, you know, I recommend get rid of the collar. And get rid of the bookcase behind you, and uh, and I'm not kidding. He said uh, maybe like arrive on skateboard or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I thought, oh my god, you know, it's uh, like I can't skateboard. Uh, I mean, that's what a great on. idea. Because yeah. I think I think yeah, like young people can see yeah. through that in a yeah. second. Yeah. All that stuff, you know? <laughs> that's trivialization. But, but yes, it is. And I thought that having having a priest with a Roman collar appearing kind of unabashedly and saying, okay, here's here's what we're about, is a good thing in that mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. And yes, you get a lot of mud thrown at you. No question mm-hmm. about it. And I mean, this morning, this morning, I had people throwing money at me. I, I checked the what's come in on the YouTube stuff, you know, over overnight. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, people were well, bad-mouthing well, me. And- you, you, just, you just mentioned uh, the atheists, and <clears throat> I think we should dive into that because yeah. statistically speaking, I just looked up some t- statistics today, um, the I think it's one one fourth of Americans now are not religious. Something like one third of four million, yeah, or something. Like yeah, one third of uh, of millennials consider themselves non religious, and yeah. a large percentage of them, some of them consider them spiritual but not religious, and then a large percentage also believe to be atheists. And so there seems to be this explosion of atheism. One of the and I've heard you discuss this, and I would love for you to do this on yeah. our podcast. One of the most difficult, I guess, positions or questions that an atheist will pose to a person like yourself is, you know, if God exists and if he's all loving, why is there so much evil and terrible things in the world? Why does that exist if, if, if he's there? And I, I always feel like the atheist will pr- present that as one of their strongest yeah. arguments. Well, it, it is a strong argument. It's an old argument. Um, Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, you know, when he writes, he'll always list the objections first. So the position he's going to take. But then there's the objections. Like, well, people say there is no God because, well, and Thomas makes that very argument. He'll say, if if one of two contraries be infinite, the other would be destroyed. If there was mm-hmm. an infinite heat, there'd be no cold. That's his example. So he goes, well, if God is described as the infinite good, then there should be no evil. But there is evil. Therefore, there's no God. Well, that's a good argument. That's a very pithy argument. Thomas Aquinas states that in the 13th century. So my point is, it's a very old argument. Uh, uh, objection that we've been, you know, wrestling with. And I'd say certainly from an emotional standpoint, I totally, totally get it. Uh, any one of us, we've all lived through suffering. Everyone, you know, after the age of 10 or whatever, you, you know about the suffering of the world. I was um, a pastor for many years, a parish priest, you know, and you deal all the time with people who are who are suffering. And trust me, every one of them at some point will say, 
how could this be? Why? Why, yeah. why is this the case? I mean, so it's an old question. It's a question of enormous uh, emotional power, which I totally get. But let me just say something from a strictly kind of rational standpoint. From a strictly rational standpoint, it's not a good argument. Now, why? Because the first premise of it has to be uh, there is senseless suffering in the world. Then the second premise would be, but, but God is all good and all loving, all powerful, uh, and, and those two are irreconcilable, therefore there's no God, see? But the first premise is predicated upon the assumption that we understand all of space and all of time. See what I'm saying? For us to say, oh, that's senseless suffering, it makes zero sense, there's no justification for that suffering, we'd have to have a completely godlike command of all of space and all of time to see every consequence, every um, circumstance, every result. But see, of course, we don't have that view. We, we have a little tiny swatch of reality that we see, a little teeny tiny bit of space and time that we see. And from that very narrow perspective, we can say, that makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. But see, God, who has an infinite knowledge of all the space and all of time, can God therefore allow certain evils to bring about a greater good, to permit a greater good, that we can't see. I mean, even in principle, we can't see it. But that God allows evil so as to bring about a greater good. Now, that's the classical response to the objection. Not that God produces evil, but God permits certain evils to bring about greater goods. Can we sometimes see them? Yeah, I think sometimes you can see, oh yeah, it's because of that suffering or that evil, something happened that never would have happened otherwise. Sometimes we can't. Often we can't, you know, but that's not surprising given our extremely narrow take on the world. So that's my point there is, is emotionally, I totally get it. That's why it's been around for so long, that objection. But from a strictly rational standpoint, it's, it's really not a very convincing argument. Um, here, here's a dumb example, but I was uh, I saw my nephew when I was um, in Chicago this summer. My nephew was going into his second year at MIT, right? So super smart kid with math and all that. And I was like mildly good at math in high school, but then I kind of gave up on it. So the higher, higher math, I have no idea what's going on. So just for fun, he's like straight A's at MIT. So brilliant kid. So just for fun, I said, hey, tell me about some of your classes, you know, old oh, differential equations and blah, 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 blah. And then he's going on about, in, in tremendous detail, he's sketching uh, equations for me. I look at it, I said, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me. That's just a lot of, you know, scratching on the page. It, it doesn't mean anything. I don't, I don't know what that means. Was he, in a way, that's analogous to our saying in the face of evils, that makes no sense. That's senseless suffering. Mm. Well, it's like, it's like, I can't say to my nephew, look, that doesn't make any sense yeah, for me, but he gets it. He has, he has a much higher mind than I do when it comes to me. He gets it. He understands all that. So now bring it to the, to the level of God. Right. Who knows, a million times higher. <laughs> right. Who knows all the space and all of time. Why is a certain evil permitted? Well, who knows? Maybe there's a good that will come of it uh, in a hundred years <laughs> that, that we can't even begin to sense right now. Why was this terrible thing permitted or so on? Well, because of that. And then do a little more broadly too. A lot of the suffering we deal with is a result of uh, freedom, right? Mm. Of the misuse of freedom. It's like Hitler. Everyone brings up Hitler, you know, the Holocaust. Well, what is that? But it's a, it's a gross example of, of the misuse of freedom. So what's the alternative? That, that God takes away freedom, mm. right? I mean, why would God permit that? Well, one of the classic answers is, well, because he wants us to be free. And the minute you say that, you have to say uh, that freedom uh, has to be allowed to go wrong from time to time, you know? Mm. So anyway, that, that's sort of a framework anyway for looking at it. Mm. Um, I used to tell my students at the seminary, I, mean, I wouldn't recommend using these arguments with people who are going through suffering. See, that's... Sure. You, you wouldn't go to the bedside of someone who's... And say, well, let me, you know, it's, it's God's allowing it to bring about a greater good. Well, it's true, but you wouldn't say it to someone who's going through suffering. But I think you can step back from, from evil and then speculate in these ways. Mm. So, it's almost as if uh, you have to know you can do bad so that you can do good. Otherwise, yeah. neither one of those. 
Yeah, I mean, it's something. It's an awful truth about freedom that if freedom is to be freedom, then we have to allow the possibility of its misuse. Mm. And so, sin has so many, of course, negative, horrible consequences. Here's a basic biblical idea: is that God, God can reshuffle the deck in a way that's always inviting us to deeper life. You know, it's a dumb example again, but you know the um, the Waze app. Do you guys had to use the yeah. Waze app? Well, when I came, I didn't know before I came out here, and I got it. Now I use it every day. But one thing I love about the Waze app is if you, I, I trust it now implicitly. I mean, I just follow it wherever <laughs> it tells me to go. I do. Uh, but in the beginning, especially when I was out here for the, I, I didn't quite know what's going on, and I, well, it doesn't sound right. I'd go somewhere else. The Waze app wouldn't uh, chastise me. It would just patiently reshuffle the deck and say, "Oh, now that you've taken that dumb move, let me get you back where you're supposed to go." And I've often thought it's it's a uh, analogy to uh, the divine will, the divine voice, that God mm. directing us, summoning us, luring us, calling us. And well, we always take the wrong road. No, 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 I'll, I, I can handle this. I'll go the way I want to go. Well, the biblical idea is God <laughs> reshuffles the deck. All right, now, having made that stupid move, let me try to get mm. you back You know where I want you to be. So uh, God brings good out of evil. A- again, that's... There is the great principle, right? God can draw good out of evil, uh, even tremendous evil. Um, and now that's that's a master theme of the Bible, over and over again. The Bible showing how this happens. Why, why do you think? Why think? Uh, why do you think free will is there? Why why is there free will, and why not just have us all directed to the right place? Well, it's interesting. It's a really high philosophical question you're raising because I think both are true in a way. First of all, why free will? Because God doesn't want us to, to be puppets. If we're just puppets, then, then we're not really um, in love with him, right? God wants his love to awaken our love in response. It's like, would you want to uh, have your wife uh, like an automaton, just doing exactly what you want all the time? No, what you want is this wonderful dance whereby your love awakens an answering love on her part. And then the two of you enter into this sort of play of, of freedom, right? And you you fall in love with each other. There's a kind of surrender, but it's done freely. That's what we want. I mean, you wouldn't want to be in relation to a robot right. or, or a puppet or automaton. Mm-hmm. So same with God. Is God vis-a-vis his creation? I mean, he wants us to fall in love with him, and that can only happen through freedom. But if, once you say freedom, you have to say the possibility of the abuse of freedom. See, so the the price you're paying for authentic love is the possibility of sin, right? So that, that's that's how that part of it works. But um, but but it, you're, the way you put it was very interesting because God does lure us and draw us, but precisely through our freedom. What I mean is, is I could if I have tremendous power, I could like make you do what what I want you to do. Right. I could boss you around. I could conf- I could coerce you. Or, see, I don't know you at all. I'd have to get to know you a lot better. If I started to understand what you like, what you're interested in, what motivates you, what fascinates you, and I wanted to get you to go someplace or do something I wanted, I could lure you with those things. I could somehow place those in your path. You Signs. Know? Like, uh, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, right? So if you told me, I actually saw Bob Dylan here in Santa Barbara. He came uh, a couple summers ago. But if you said to me, let's say for sake of argument, uh, Bob Dylan is coming to the Santa Barbara mission and he's performing tonight at eight o'clock. Where am I going to be? <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you know that anyone that knows me know, now, as I get there to the show, you're getting what you want. Let's say you wanted me there. You mm. got what you wanted, but did you violate my freedom? Mm. No, you awakened my freedom. Right. You, mm. you gave my freedom what it wanted. So, See, so based off that, that voice is contagious. So based off that, do you think that everybody gets these kind of opportunities or signs and it's we some of us continue to not den- deny them like I yes I do think God is continually luring us toward relationship with him and uh, you know we just finished filming uh, in our, our pivotal player series on Flannery O'Connor the great uh, Catholic author and she said her stories are about the offer of grace usually refused mm. <laughs> that's what makes her story so dramatic and that's a cool way to describe much of life the offer of grace, like the Waze app. Here's where you go. Let me show you. Here's the path. Usually refused. No, no, I don't want to go that way. I go my way. Okay, let me show you again. No, no, I don't want to go that way. 
Okay, let me show you again. I think that's the biblical view of God, who never tires of trying to draw his people into a, a relationship of love with him, you know? And we say, no, 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 no. And God patiently reshuffles the deck, patiently tries again, you know? Um, I think that's a really fundamental biblical idea. Why do you think people do that? Why do you think people con- will deny that consistently and constantly? It's called in our tradition the mysterium iniquitatis, the mystery of evil, of, of iniquity. And, and the first word's important. It really is a mystery. And that's why the doctrine of the fall is really important. And I think dead right. You know, the doctrine unique to Christianity, that there's something wrong with us. You know? <laughs> something went wrong with us, that we're not meant to be this way. We're meant for love. We're meant for relationship with God and therefore with each other. That's what's implied in the great Genesis story of, of the garden, right? Don't literalize it as history, but it's a, it's a theological poem that's making the point that God intended for us life, right? But from the beginning, what did we do? Is we opt against it. We, Paul Tillich, the great Protestant theologian, said that the key is fear, that the fall comes from fear, and fear is born of our finitude, right? So we're mm. limited. Because we're limited, we get afraid. I, I better protect myself. I, you're a danger to me. Uh, mm. I, I got to be careful. See? And when you make that move, then your whole life becomes self-protective. Now the ego emerges. And that's what the, the poetry about the knowledge of good and evil comes in there. Mm. It's, the, it's the kind of birth Awakening of the, of the ego. The, the birth of the, of the defended self, right? And God is trying to lure us now that reads salvation history all the way to Christ is trying to lure us out of that stance, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that's what, it, something's gone wrong with us from the beginning, I would say, and then we all inherit it. It's like um, someone born into a dysfunctional family, right? Mm. Uh, where there's physical abuse or alcohol abuse or something. That's all the kid knows. The, the kid comes into that family. That's all he knows is this world of, of addiction and violence and fear and all this. But he's got to be lifted out of that world into a different one to see a new, another possibility. So that's the human race. Is we're, we're born into a deeply dysfunctional world. I was wondering, too, with Genesis, like, is it possible to have a utopian world as far as like everything working out and not having... I just feel like there's a lot of resistance towards... Oh, yeah. No, and what I would say, beings. the theological answer is as... And I'll use technical language as an eschatological hope. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> eschaton just means the end times, right? That we hold out, we call it the second coming of Jesus, which is the full establishment of the kingdom of God here below. That's the trajectory of the Bible, it's toward that. That's what we were hoping for, you know? So at Mass, we look forward to the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. That means the end of space and time, right? We live in the in between times in between the salvation of, of the cross and the fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And the church's job is to try its best to embody the kingdom, the utopia, if you want. The place, by the way, to look for that is the mass. The mass is the display of what the world would look like if we were all in love with God and praising God. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? All of us coming together from different backgrounds and different walks of life and education. We all come together. We sing together. <laughs> the, the, the songs, that we sing together. We're not fighting, arguing. We're singing together, right? Then together, we're hearing the word of God and we're responding to it. And then we're being fed by God. There's the Eucharist. We're being fed by Christ's body and blood. And then we sing our thanksgiving and then we're sent out into the world, right? Go, the mass has ended. Go, love and serve the Lord. So the mass is what you're driving. The mass is utopia, if you want. It's that moment when we say, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. Now go and, and turn the world into the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're not living in utopia, God knows. And uh, I don't anticipate it any time in, <laughs> in my lifetime. But the mass is the moment when, it's, when it appears. Mm-hmm. I heard you say on one of your videos, and it was very, very powerful to me, how people try to fill their spiritual bucket with things that yeah. are material or not spiritual how it's just an endless yeah. basically an endless hole and we just talked earlier about the the, the basic the rise of non-religious or non or spir- yeah, yeah or postmodernism or, yeah scientism or whatever you want to yeah. call it 
you also simultaneously have um, an explosion of depression, anxiety, yep. and suicide, especially among yep. uh, young men, in a time of, of incredible wealth and yeah. opportunity. And apparently, we have, we have everything at our fingertips. Which yeah. is, what's, is, is that a spiritual... Are we in a spiritual crisis right now? Yeah. And you put your finger right on it. That's exactly... There's a causal relationship between those two things. Um, that's a way to name original sin, too, is... Happiness will come, we convince ourselves, by getting filled up. And, and the big four are wealth, pleasure, honor, and power. Aquinas said that. Um, well, that hasn't changed since then. No, and it never changes. That's the basic human thing, is we think some combination of those four things will make me happy, right? Talk to any kid, talk to any 85-year-old. What will make me happy? I don't even have enough wealth, enough pleasure, honor, and power. I'll be happy. And the, tr- the reason I'm unhappy is I don't have enough of those things, mm-hmm. right? That's the formula. That's a trap. That's a trap that we all fall into. And as you say, I'll spend my whole life trying to fill up the emptiness. If I just get enough wealth, so I need more and I need more and I need more. But see, the problem is there's a contradiction because the, the hunger is for God and God is infinite. See, so nothing in the world is going to fill up my hunger for God. And the more I try, the crazier I'm going to get. I'm going to get addicted because it's going to start driving me crazy. I, well, I, I've got a million dollars. I'm not happy. I need $5 million. I got it, but now I, I'm not happy. I need $10 million. Now, do the other one, pleasure. Oh, I've got this great you know, pleasure, but now I'm unhappy again. I just I need more pleasure. Talk to anyone addicted to sex or pornography, right? Or to, or to booze or whatever it is. Um, power, same thing. If I just get enough power, you know. If I'm elected mayor, then I'll be happy. And then after a year of mayor, I'm looking around, I, I need more power, you know. And then I try and try and try but none of that's going to work. Uh, what will work is filling yourself up with God. But then here's where it gets really tricky and why, why so many of us miss it. God is not an object or a thing, right? God is love, St. John said. And so to be filled with God is to be filled with self-emptying. <laughs> that's why, mm-hmm. see, the saints are so rare that, that get that formula. <laughs> if I want to be filled up, which we all do, right? Everyone's got a hungry heart. I need to fill it with self-emptying. Now, Mother Teresa and the rest of the saints who got that principle. And then the more you give your life away, the more you get filled up with what you actually want. And it's, that's not a nice little sentimental thing. That's spiritual physics that I'm laying out based on the spiritual masters. It's spiritual physics. Uh, the addictive rhythm that you put your finger on correctly is no, no, more, more, more. Fill it up, fill it up, fill it up. And what it produces is an epidemic of depression and uh, self-loathing and suicide at the limit. In fact, I think a lot of the people who who want those things, one of the worst things that could happen to them is they get everything yeah. that they think they want. And we talked about this on our show a few episodes ago where you see celebrities, you know, who have all the money, all the women, all the drugs, all the whatever they want. Some of the most unhappy people. And they kill yes. themselves. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Oscar Wilde said the only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want. You know, so, but that's that's a very deep spiritual principle. Uh, what I want, see, ask that question. Remember in the Gospels when um, when Jesus uh, turns on the two disciples of, of John who are following him. You know, there because John had said, "Oh, there he is. Go after him, the Lamb of God." So they go after him, and he, he turns on them and says, "What do you want?" That's a really cool question. A really, a really important question. Imagine the Lord in front of you right now. What do you want? What do you want? Mm. And their wonderful answer is, it's, it's a very Jewish thing because it's all question answering question. They say, where, where do you stay? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's very interesting. It's not just, you know, what's your domicile? It's, what, what are you about? Like, well, who are you? What, where do you stay? And he says, come and see. And then it says, they stayed with him. That little rhythm is really important in terms of discipleship. Mm. What do you want? The Lord says to you. Oh, I want wealth, pleasure, honor, power. Well, everybody wants. Mm. It's not going to do it. But, but how wonderful when he's, no, well, you know, I, I want to know where you stay. Okay, good. Come and see. And they stayed with him. Now, watch it because staying with Jesus means what? The cross, ultimately. That's where he's going. You know, that's where he mm-hmm. stays. He stays in the will of his father, which is self-emptying love. See? And so it's dangerous. It is. It's dangerous to say, I'm going to stay with Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus because he only goes one place. <laughs> You know, talk about your Waze app. I mean, he's only got one direction, and it's toward the cross. Which is not morbidity. It means toward self-emptying love. 
mm-hmm. whatever form that's going to take in your life. But that's the key to joy. If you try this bucket thing of filling it up, that's going to lead down a bad path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you said something. I want to back up all when we talked about Genesis about not literalizing it. Yeah. How do you how do you know what parts of the Bible to literalize and which ones not? That's, that's a great because one of the yeah. biggest criticisms is of the Bible is well that couldn't have happened yeah, and that's right. impossible and that's not right. real. Well, a couple of things I'll say about it. First, that the Bible, uh, the word Bible comes from the Greek word ta biblia, which is plural. It means the books, right? The books. So the Bible's not a book. It's a collection of books. Hmm. It's more like a library, right? Hmm. It's like, more like a biblioteca. It's a library. Well, the library is full of books of different genre, right? right. Poetry. Different, yeah, it's got poetry. Philosophy. It's got history. It's got philosophy. It's got uh, 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 journalism, et cetera. So when you go in the library, you're going to say, well, now, do I take every book in the library literally? Well, of course not. Nor do you say, oh, yeah, it's all poetry. Nor do you say, oh, it's all journalism. you got to be careful. You have to look around. And, hmm. and furthermore, the library might have signs like, you know, hey, history section. But what happens usually is you learn how to read books within a community of interpretation that tells you what they are. So when I was a little kid, people would hand me a book and they would – Help me read it. Well, here's what this book is. I think that's a fairy tale. It didn't really happen, but it's it's a cool story. You know, you'll like it. Or I mean, when I was eight years old, reading a biography of Abe Lincoln, it started my lifelong love for Lincoln. Well, I mean, I knew. I forget who told me, but it's not a fairy tale. That's a history story. That's really about him. Then later on, it gets refined. Oh, now this book of Lincoln uh, is going to correct some things that you read there because it's more sophisticated. You know, okay. Or let's say there's a, a book of Shakespeare. And I say, okay, open it up the page, you know, 357, start reading Hamlet. Well, is that going to work? Well, no, I mean, it's not read Hamlet just, just spontaneously. Rather, you take a Shakespeare class, you talk to actors, you um, read a history of, of the interpretation of Hamlet. My point here is it's always within a community of interpretation that you learn how to read books. Now, the Bible. We would call the community of interpretation the church. It's probably not a good idea, we say as Catholics, to just hand someone the Bible. Off you go. Because they're not going to read it right. They won't know what kind of books these are. They won't know the history of interpretation. Better, we'd say, read it within the community and discipline of the church. And you'll learn thereby um, how to read these books and what they are. Um, When I was doing like advanced scripture studies, then you get into things like genre analysis. You get into history. You get into... Uh, the community being addressed. Uh, I would say like with the book of Genesis, within the book of Genesis, you've got different genre. So you can't just say, oh, the Genesis is, is, it's all legend, it's all myth, it's all history. It's actually kind of a mix of different things, different parts of it, you know? The church tells us and teaches us how to read it. Um, Mm -hmm. And see, people always look for a univocal answer. Like the Bible, it's literally true. Mm -hmm. Or the Bible, it's all myth. No, the Bible is history, saga, legend, poetry, letters, apocalypse, gospel. Those are all different literary forms, you know? Mm. And the sensitive reader kind of learns how to approach it, I would say, through the church. Mm. Now, do you think this is what's kind of got us in trouble, too, as humans? Because this also begs the question of, how did we get to this place where we have all these different denominations? Yeah. Yeah. And is that why? Is it because of so many different interpretations and then people have taken it, off? Like, explain that. It's partially, yeah, especially in the Christian dispensation, if you, you look at the, uh, the Reformation. So, uh, Western Christianity splits, splinters, really. And part of it, I would say, yeah, is when Martin Luther uh, encouraged what he called private interpretation or private judgment. He was confident that if you hand someone the Bible, they'd be able to read it effectively. Mm. Now, I would say as a Catholic... The very fact that you have 30,000 Protestant denominations disproves that fact <laughs> because it, it shows that, no, Some I read it this way, you there. read it that way, and uh, uh, now we're going to gather, but then this person disagrees with how the pastors read, so he's going to break off from his own church. And yeah, I would say that's a problematic thing. I would say read the Bible within the church. I wouldn't recommend private interpretation because mm-hmm. then you're going to lead to this splintering. I got to ask one thing, though, that's... I've always wondered as far as like the books, like you, you see what's canon. You also see like a book, like the book of Enoch. Like yeah. at what point did they select those very specific books and, and, and put how them did together? they select them? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. And, and the word canon is the right one, which just means like the, it means the, the stick that, that regulates, you know, the canon is, is what determines things. 
So the church, again, I would say, meaning the community of believers, at various points in history would gather certain books and say, yeah, this reflects, these reflect what we believe. Hmm. Other books know, for whatever reason, there's some problematic elements or they seem it's more confused. They don't represent the faith of the living community. So they were not canonized, right? They were not accepted in the canon. I would say don't read that as some kind of aggressive power play. It's a community seeking to understand itself and making a judgment about certain books that are reflective of that faith and others that aren't. Now, bring it into the New Testament times, the same thing goes on. Hmm. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four canonical gospels. So at a certain point, and it actually happened quite early, so into the second century, people like St. Irenaeus, who lived around the year 150, 160, they were making judgments that, yeah, these gospels are reflective of the living faith of the church. Now, as other gospels emerged, the so-called Gnostic gospels, for example, mm-hmm. Gospel of Thomas and so on, they emerged. They're there. They're floating around. At certain moments in its history, the church said, no, they don't reflect adequately the, the faith of the church. Does that mean they're all bad? No. I've read all the Gnostic Gospels. They have interesting elements, Thomas especially. You know, Does it reflect currents within the life of the early church? Yeah, probably. But the church judged at a certain point, they don't do it adequately, mm. so they won't be included in the canon. There's a tendency in academic circles today because we're very sensitive to this stuff, is to read that as a, as a power play. You know, the yeah. powerful, patriarchal mm. people, and they're excluding these voices. I, I don't think it's right to read it that way. I'd read it as a community in a legitimate way, kind of policing itself and, and seeking to, to find the text that best reflect its faith. Sure. You know? hmm. Something um, else about the, the Bible is there, there seems to be two very different representations of God between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you have what seems to be a God that Brimstone displays lots fire, of wrath right? yeah. and, and intervenes into people's lives quite actively. And then the one that you know appears afterwards and now where we don't necessarily see that or hear that or feel that, how do we reconcile that? Well, first, it's simplistic, I think, to say it that way. And, and everyone does. It's a very common thing. Yeah. But you know, could a mother forget her child? Uh, could the Lord forget his own? I've carved you in the palm of my hand. That's the Old Testament. You know, I mean, and I can find numerous passages that speak of God's, you know, tender mercy and compassion. In fact, that term chesed in Hebrew, which is rendered beautifully as tender mercy in the King James Bible, well, that's an Old Testament term. That's the the mark of God's way of being. And so I, it's just simplistic to say that, you know, the Old Testament is just this thundering, legalistic, you know, overbearing God. Uh, there's plenty of language of, of God's tender mercy and compassion in the Old Testament. More to the point, the New Testament, I mean, line up the sayings of Jesus, it, it ain't all sweetness and light. I mean, Jesus is pretty harsh and pretty judgmental sometimes and pretty angry. You know, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed sepulchers, you know, uh, impressive on the outside, but on the inside filled with filth and dead men's bones. That doesn't sound like, you know, Mr. Sunshine to me. So my point there is the God of both great mercy and judgment is throughout the Bible. Okay, now, what does it mean to say God is angry or that God is judging? It doesn't mean that God is falling into a snit, you know, or that God is is now in some some agitated emotional state. It's a symbol, the divine anger. It's a symbol for God's passion to set things right, you know? A good parent looking at his child going down a bad path, right? What's he or she going to do? Hey, you're great. God bless you. You're doing... <laughs> No, the parent's gonna gonna rail and and scream and shout and maybe jump in and intervene, right? If it's really dramatic, um, the divine wrath in the Bible it seems to me is a symbol of God's passion to set it right. That God God hates sin; He hates what sin has done to us, and so He rails against it. Read the prophets now, you know Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, those people, and and talk about thundering denunciation. <clears throat> Yeah, God hates injustice. God hates the fact that, that widows and orphans are being abused. God hates the fact that people are, are, are cheating, that people are stealing, that there's corruption. God hates that, and the prophets express that passion to set it right. Even, go all the way now to the cross. The cross is so many things, but it's also seen classically as an expression of God's anger. 
We say God's wrath being poured out on the son. But don't read that as some like weird alcoholic father working out his anger <laughs> issues. It's not that at all. It means God setting the world right. See, the cross is the great act by which God takes on all the cruelty and hatred and stupidity and injustice of the world. He takes it on himself, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we say, right? Mm. And so in that great cross, there's a judgment on the world. Again, it's biblical language. God's God's passion to set the world right. And it happens as he absorbs on the cross all the negativity of the world. And then in the resurrection shows forth the divine forgiveness and mercy, right? That's the whole story of Christianity. So plenty of room, anger, judgment, railing, all that. But don't read it psychologically, you know? <laughs> Uh, read it as a an expression of God's salvation. Hmm. How do you how do you think he feels about what I feel, I think we're in a unique time right now with this gender neutrality movement? How do you think he he feels about that, and how do you deal with that at, during these times? Because we've never seen something like this before. You mean the whole uh, gender transition Identity stuff politics. and all yes. that? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, what's the the bottom line is always God is love, right? So. Uh, God loves. That's all he does. That's all God knows how to do is love. That's it's an old saying from one of the fathers. That's all he's got in his bag. I mean, so as God comes forth, it comes forth as a blessing, right? But if God is only yes, right? God's blessing, God is, is love, yes. But if something is off kilter, then um, the yes appears as a no to the no. Does that make sense? So if something's off kilter, it's in, in, the, in the world, it's a kind of no to what God intends. When God says no to that no, that's a yes. <laughs> a double negative is a yes. And so can we identify certain things as off of kilter, as, as out of step with what God intends? Um, yeah, and so the church, giving voice to God's will, we'd say here, says no to them. But that's that's in service of the great yes of God, you know? It's a no to a no. Um, because the gender stuff, you know, it's it, it doesn't come down to our freedom to decide everything, right? I, I just decide the person I will be. I'll, I'll decide what gender mm. I'm going to have. Um, we recognize an objectivity to what God has created, what God desires. And so our freedom is not able simply to determine the way things are. Mm. You know, that's a quick answer to what. Complex, complex question. question. Yeah. What, well, I'll give you an easy one. What is God? <laughs> what is God? Yeah. But, you know, we, is he a being, a supreme being that that kind of watches and controls things, as as the or 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 not controls things, as the as atheists will say. You know, we you know, religious people will perceive him as. So right. What is God? And yeah. There's well, multiple good. interpretations, right? Yeah. Well, and that's it's the it's the best question. It's, it's the ultimate question. Um, I'll do it two ways. One, I've already said that God is love. And that should give us a, a clue. So first of all, we're not talking about an object or a thing. It's very interesting is that St. John uses a verb to describe God. So God is love. Our doctrine of the Trinity comes from that, right? Because if God is love, not just love is just something God does. And so it, we can all, we love sometimes and we don't love other times, right? It's an attribute, it's an activity of ours. But we say God is love. Then there has to be in God a lover, a beloved, and the love that they share, right? So the lover we call the father, the son is the beloved, and the spirit is the love that the two of them share. So that's one way to answer the question, what is God? God is love. God is a, is a community, is a play. We call them persons because we have no better word to use. We don't quite know what we're saying, but there's a play of lover, beloved, and love. The other way to get at it is to use the great term being, you know, we say God is not a being. So this room is full of beings. There's this bottle, there's me, there's a table, there's you, you know, there's beings in this room. Objects. And, and our scientific minds are really good at picking out beings. You know, so I can pick you out from the environment. I can isolate you, analyze you, and then compare them to you. So we're good at that. We're good at dealing with beings, right? So what we, we naturally extrapolate from that and say, oh, well, God, God's the biggest being of them all, right? So God's the supreme being. Well, I would argue that's precisely what God is not. Um, Thomas Aquinas says God is not a being, but um, 
ipsum esse is his Latin. And, and again, it's very interesting because esse in Latin is an infinitive. It means to be. Right? Hmm. An ends in Latin, ENS, would be a being. That's an ends, right? It's a so our like entity comes from that. It's a being. But God's not an ends in Aquinas. He's an essay. And ipsum means itself. God is to be itself. God is the zoom of being. He's the actus ascendi, Aquinas says, the act of being. Ascendi is a gerundive. It has an ing quality to it. God is the actus act of being. Now, my point there is God's the great energy of existence in and through which all things come to be, in and through which beings have their existence, right? So he's not competing with us. He's not like one supreme being alongside of the other beings. I think all kinds of mischief comes from that idea. God is ipsum esse, the sheer act of to be, in and through which all beings are sustained in being. Now, the point there is, he's not competing with us, right? In fact, I find myself the more I surrender to God. It's not like surrender to God means, oh, I got to I give up. I give up. Supreme being, I'll do whatever you want. Oh, supreme being, I'll, I, I'll obey you. See, that's all the wrong way to think about it. Then we get into all the problems, I think you're, you're driving at this, that modern people tend to have. Well, God, overbearing and legalistic and tell me what to do and you know, suppressing my humanity. See, that's precisely wrong, though. That's precisely the wrong way to think about it. God is what makes me myself, right? Uh, I, I find myself in God. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. See, that, that's what he's driving at. So that's a really cool question. It's, a very, it's the most important question, what is God? Because mm. once we get that kind of straight in our minds, and a lot of problems disappear, you know what I'm saying? A lot of things disappear after that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the difficulties uh, throughout the years or decades or you know or centuries has been the has been seems to be science. How science yeah. mm-hmm. shows you know causality and ex, you know experiment the scientific method, and right. there's no evidence Empirical for God. Therefore, data. yeah, we can't show that. Uh, but when I learned history, I also learned that at one point science and the church were Harmonious. close together. Yeah. It, and then they seem to have separated and now seem to be at a seem to be or at least are presented yeah. as, as opposing yeah. you believe one or you believe the right. other why and how did that happen that's a great question and, and it, you're right it's, it's it, in many surveys it's the number one reason people are leaving the church they'll yes. say because religion and science are at odds and, and I'll take science and I'll leave religion behind which drives me crazy I tear my hair out when that happens mm. when I hear that um, how to get at it um, the sciences deal quite legitimately with the empirical order. That means the, the world that you can see, you take in with your senses, you can measure it, you can um, analyze it, you see the objects and phenomena in the empirically verifiable world. That's the sciences. And then you got the scientific method, right? Is you observe, and then you hypothesize, and then you experiment, and you repeat the experiment, you draw conclusions, and, and you come up with deeper truths about the world. Great. Love it. In fact, the scientific method emerged out of universities, which are all Christian universities in the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. That's where the, the method emerged. It's really good at dealing with the objects and phenomena within the visible realm. It's terrific at that. And the church at its best has affirmed it and still affirms it. The problem is not science. It's scientism, as I've called it. And I call it, and that's the standard term for it, is, is the reduction of all knowledge to the scientific form of knowledge. So what I just described there is great, you know, but it's one way of knowing reality, the scientific way. Scientism tends to say, that's it. That's the only way to know reality. Everything is reducible to the sciences. Therefore, religion, like philosophy, is best construed as kind of like primitive science. God help them. God bless them. Weren't they great? Mm. You know, they tried hard back in the day. <laughs> yeah. But now we've let go of all that, and so now we're serious scientists, and we leave let go of that. See, but the whole point is, let's stay with philosophy. Before we get to religion, philosophy. Philosophy is not primitive science. Philosophy is something else. It's another way 
of asking questions. It's a different order of questions about mm. reality. And you shouldn't reduce philosophy to science. That's why Aristotle had his physics, right? His great book of physics. And in many ways, modern science is going to evolve out of a book like that. But then he's got a book called the metaphysics, right? Mm. So he's beyond the physics. And when you've studied philosophy, that's how I kind of got in the game as a, as a student of philosophy, is you, you get it. You get what those great early figures were driving at. There's a dimension of reality which transcends the merely empirical that can't be gotten at through mere observation and experimentation. That's gotten at rationally, but not scientifically. Now read everybody from Plato to Alfred North Whitehead, and you've got the history of metaphysics, you know? Hmm. So I would say then with religion, you've got another dimension there. But um, I, I'm, I'm a sworn enemy of scientism. And it's driving our young people crazy because it's locking them into such a narrow take on reality. Um, you know, one way, to, one way to tease people out of scientism, I found, is, um, so, I go back to Hamlet. You read Shakespeare's Hamlet. Does that tell you anything true about the world? I, mean, I hope it does. I, I mean, it's yes. entertaining, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's all these wonderful things, but is it also telling you something true about the world and about humanity and about history and about, well, yeah, of course it is. It's these great works of art. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Does that tell you something true of course it does, you know. Um, uh, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. It's not a science text, obviously, but is it telling you something true? Well, well yeah. I mean, the truth <laughs> breaks out in all kinds of ways that are non-scientific. And I just am afraid that a lot of young people are being seduced into a sort of very reductive scientism. And that, that tends to pillory all these other forms as just, oh, well, you know, mm. primitive science or mm. trivial and so on. I don't know, these are some of the deepest intuitions of the human race, but they're not in science texts, mm -hmm. you know? So it's giving full weight to the sciences, and totally for the sciences, but a sworn opponent of scientism. That's kind of my perspective. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, one of the biggest fears I have with, uh, with science or scientism is it's by nature, uh, it doesn't have a moral code. By nature, yeah. it doesn't say... Is this right or is this wrong? That's right. It's test and result, test and result. Yeah. And so my biggest fear is without that moral compass, science will do what it can. Yeah. It, it doesn't That's stop. Right. It doesn't We're stop. We're going to clone humans. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question as should we. No, quite right. And that's, that's, that's a good way to get at it is uh, scientists tell you all kinds of things, but they won't tell you, for example, why something's beautiful. Scientists can't tell you that. Science, science could analyze the Sistine Chapel ceiling and tell you what the paint is, and you know, it can't tell you why it's beautiful. That's, right. a, that's a philosophical question. It's an aesthetic question. Nor can it tell you, as you say quite rightly, that that act is is right or wrong. It can't tell you that. Mm. You can't observe, experiment, hypothesize to figure that out. Mm. Uh, and so that that reduction of everything to science is not just epistemologically problematic. It's morally and spiritually problematic. It's, um, it's locking us in, um, I've always loved Charles Taylor's term, the buffered self. I'm in this little contain, container. I'm buffered from any contact with the transcendent, you know? Mm. That's the danger with it. Yeah. And that makes people crazy too, you know? And I see with, with young people, is that a scientific view of the world is so uh, delimiting. Well, ultimately, if you take that scientific rationalism to its end, you become this extremely self. It doesn't make any sense to be altruistic. It doesn't make any yeah. sense to, to you know, give yourself to someone else or to help someone else. It's like, yeah. well, I just take care of me. That's just what makes sense. Yeah, right, right. Because you'll bracket those questions as uninteresting or unresolvable mm -hmm. or um, just a matter of subjective mm -hmm. desire. I, mean, I can't tell you the number of times, and I, I always try to back people into a corner on it because. They'll say some version of, hey, morality, it's up to me. It's up to the individual. Yeah, what do you well, think about that? That's well, the trouble is, I say to people, then how do you argue with Hitler? So Hitler and Goering and Goebbels say, yeah, yeah, we decided that killing six million Jews is, is the right thing to do. And they really did. <laughs> Psychologically, they really did think that was the right thing to do. How do you argue with them? If morals is just a matter of my private opinion, how do you argue with Hitler? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the very fact that, that implicitly we all know that what Hitler did was, was a gross immorality proves that no one really believes morality is simply a matter of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Well, of course we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how do you t- how do you say oh yeah you know sexual abuse of children uh, that's a bad thing how how would you know that if someone says oh no I, that's what I'm into I mean I like that I, I think it's a good thing hmm. how do you argue hmm. see again like breaking us out of a mere subjectivity uh, that's why I like this guy he's not a household name but important thinker called Dietrich von Hildebrand and he talked about the uh, the objectively valuable versus the merely subjectively satisfying. It's a, really, it's a cool uh, distinction, simple but penetrating. The, the merely subjectively satisfying is, you know, I like pizza. So I'm not going to argue you into liking pizza. I mean, it's just my subjective thing. So we understand that category. Or like, yeah, yeah, he's into baseball and he's really not. Okay, I get it. It's just a subjective thing. But there are objective values that transcend my mere private uh predilection right and these are aesthetic values like beautiful things moral values spiritual values that are not my construction they're not my little private preserve they they have broken into my life from the outside and they have a they have a a hold on me you know what i'm saying the loss of that category is really bad and everything gets reduced Mm. to the merely subjectively satisfying Mm. that causes a lot of mischief Mm. Back when I considered myself a, a pretty strong uh, atheist, I did acknowledge the role of the uh, Judeo-Christian religion in creating modern Western civilization, or at least the idea that the individual has inalienable yeah. rights. Yeah. And more recently, I've heard a new phrase, uh, Christian atheists. These are people that follow the, the lessons and teachings because they work so well and because they seem to be they, in their opinion, the best, you know, objective moral code, but they don't go a step further and actually believe in. What do you say to those? Well, no. In some ways, the glass half full approach. I'd say, good, glad. It's better than than heading the right direction. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but but it, then see, keep pressing it because it's like um, uh, flowers that are that are connected to the earth. They're going to flourish. You, you cut the flowers and you put them in a in a vase of water. They'll look pretty good for a while. But then pretty soon they're gonna they're gonna fade away, right? Because they're cut off from their roots. It's a similar situation there, I think, and we see it happening. Is the great moral system of the Bible? I brought it out. Yeah, Judeo Christians, the, the great biblical view, which yeah is predicated upon creation, upon the grace of God, upon the dignity and destiny of the individual person, upon the cross of Jesus. I mean, that's where all that comes from, which informed. Ultimately, Rousseau and Voltaire and Thomas Jefferson and Immanuel Kant and everybody else it created free markets. It created, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can trace all a lot of that stuff back to it. Um, so, those who are calling themselves Christian atheists, I would say, yeah, you've cut the flowers and put them in a vase for a while, but they're going to fade away because mm-hmm. if, if they're cut from their their metaphysical and religious roots, they are going to fade. And I think it is demonstrably happening in our culture today. You can see even those great values are fading away because the metaphysical undergirding and the religious support is, uh, is evanescing. Mm. So that's, that's a really, so I'm, I'd say, great, you're doing well, Christian atheists, <laughs> hang on to what you got, mm. but I wouldn't um, rest with that. Mm. How do you know that Christianity is the right religion or the right belief? We have so many other, well, we have two other major religions in the world, um, you know, Islam and, and, and Judaism, and then you've got all these other belief systems and people would say, oh, Buddhists are very nice people and yeah. they're great and all that. How do we know, how would you argue Christianity is the... Well, I'll say a couple things. I, I, in a way that, and I, I get that question a lot. Yeah, uh, on the, that's on why the I asked it. I know that's one that you're... You... No, and in a way though, it's kind of like if someone says to a scientist, I mean, how do you know the theory of relativity is right? Mm. Well, in a way, you'd, <laughs> you need a lot of time to say, well, mm. let me explain why this whole integrated system, you know, is the best way to uh, uh, explain reality. So you can't really answer it quickly. But I'll say a couple preliminary things. One is, it's never, when it comes to religion, a question of right, wrong. Like, oh yeah, that's the right religion, the rest of y'all, you're all wrong. That's the wrong way to do it. So Vatican II taught us, you know, that there are elements of truth in all the great religions. That's a hugely important observation to make. Um, is there a lot of truth in Judaism? Well, there better be because Christianity <laughs> is, comes out of it massively. Is there, are there massive truths in Islam? Of course there are. I mean, the belief in the creator God, belief in providence, belief in, in an afterlife, et cetera, et cetera. Are there massive truths in um, Hinduism and Buddhism? Of course there are. I mean, of course, a huge 
I would say, patterns of meaning and truth in all the great religions. They wouldn't have been around so long if there weren't, right? So that's the first thing is it's not a, like, hey, we're right, you're all wrong. You know, it's to a degree, all the great religions are participating in the, in the fullness of truth. I would say the biblical view culminating in Christianity is the most compelling account of, of life and the way things are, um, congruent with reason in very profound ways. So the, the image of God that comes up out of the Bible, I think, is deeply congruent with what we can know through reason about God. So now do Thomas Aquinas, and you can show all kinds of rational grounds for belief in God, for describing God's attributes, etc. And, and it's deeply congruent with the Bible. Um, part of it is beauty. Um, why do you accept the system uh, of thought? You say, well, it, it's illuminating the way things are. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just compelling. It's just it's beautiful. And there's something of that, a lot of that, I think, in the biblical view of things, that God became one of us, that we might become partakers in his nature, that God personally came and repaired a broken world and lifted it up for the sake of its transfiguration. Show me a more compelling account of things. Show me a more beautiful account of things. I don't know one. Um, relatedly, uh, there's no humanism anywhere on offer that could be greater than Christianity because of what I just said. Uh, God became one of us that we might become sharers in God's nature. Classical, medieval, modern, Marxism. Show me any humanism. No one's got a story as cool as that and as uplifting as that and as as uh, life enhancing as that, you know? Mm. So it's the greatest humanism ever proposed. Um, but, you know, finally for Christianity, it's the compelling power of Jesus. Why do people believe in him? Because they, they found this encounter with the risen Lord so overwhelming that it changed their lives and they gave themselves to him, you know? Um, I talk about that grabbing by the lapels quality of Christianity. See, it's not like a, a detached philosophy of, hmm, I've, I've meditated and I've come to these insights and let me share them with you. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but that's not Christianity. Christianity is like these people who were, who were so blown away by what they encountered that they had to grab everyone they knew by the lapels and tell them about it. Uh, that's right. And when Paul preached, there were riots and that's throughout the Acts of the Apostles because he was, he was so overwhelmed by this manifestation of the risen Christ, you know. Um, and that's still true of evangelization. I think that we, we want to grab the whole world by the lapels and tell them about this thing that happened. Mm. Um, so anyway, th- those are just ways of kind of getting at it. But to answer the question adequately, you have to show, I'd say, the great integration of the whole biblical view of life, you know. Here, here's a quick answer just, just occurred to me from Stanley Hauerwas. Um, he's a Methodist theologian. And he said, how do you know that the, a map is right? Well, it works. It's like, it's like, your, it's like the Waze app again. How do you know that's, that's right? Well, it got me here. Right? Hey, I arrived. That's where I want to go. And so his answer was, well, Christianity works. It works. Meaning, I would say, it brings you into this living friendship with God. And uh, it works. And so I, it, it verifies itself in a way. If I use the language of like William James, it verifies itself. It 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 gets you where you want to go. Can someone have a, a a good relationship with God and not go to church or go to mass or? Yeah, you can, but again, I'd use the cut flowers thing. I, mm. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, because I I think so. I'm in relation to God, but I don't practice that relationship. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. I think it's not going to hold out in the long run well isn't this considered church like isn't it doesn't it say that when one or two are gathered yeah. in his name i mean yeah and that's okay i think mean, you can do kind of by way of participation what i mean there is that things participate to varying degrees in the church i would say now as a, as a catholic as a bishop church in the full sense means the, the mass it means being drawn into the eucharistic sacrifice of jesus again that's church in the in the full sense but then to varying degrees do you have church? Sure. Hmm. I went to a Billy Graham um, meeting years ago. I wanted to hear him, you know, this is years ago. But um, sure, there he was proclaiming the gospel. Now, in a way that I would say is not completely adequate. I mean, I'm, I, I'm a Catholic and all that. 
but yet, you know, the word of Christ went forth and people were moved by it and they were, I said, yeah, sure, that's the that's church, if you want. Not in the full sense, but that's church. So I'm okay with that. But what I wouldn't recommend is I got this interior thing. I'm going to call my relation to God, but I, I'm not going to practice it exteriorly. That's not going to hold out in the long run. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to practice the faith. Um, you got to do it. <laughs> and uh, otherwise it's not going to, Last. Sure. I got a, yeah, I got an interesting question. There's been sort of a resurgence of psychedelics making its way through for therapy and yeah. you know, helping post traumatic stress. And there's also been sort of this feel of like the sixties where people are experimenting a lot more with these types of substances. You know, how do you feel like and people are getting a lot out of it as far as like getting answers and mm-hmm. things oh. like this? Many you just hear things like I've met God or I touch yeah. I touch God or yeah, and, and I read those testimonies, and it goes back to people like you know Aldous Huxley and others back in like the 1930s who were experimenting with like LS, not LSD, not LSD that, that just emerged in the 60s, right? But whatever they were experimenting with back in the 30s, yeah, I think it probably does open up dimensions of consciousness. Mm. Probably, I remember reading an account of uh, Pete Townsend the first time he took LSDs on a plane flying back to London, and he said there he was talking to the other members of the band. He said. Then I was up on the on the ceiling of the of the uh, airplane, looking down at everybody. We had an out of the body experience. All right, I mean, I, I believe him. Something happened there. I don't know what's going on. Something triggered that in him. So I, I don't deny that that they, these uh, drugs might might produce types of consciousness, and they might open things up in fresh ways. I mean, they talk about the '60s people, the Beatles, and others will, will say that that it opened up dimensions of their mind. Um, are there analogies between that and some of the mystical traditions, both East and West, that have also allowed dimensions of consciousness to open up? Yeah, probably. You know, I guess my instinct there is it's probably safer to do uh, <laughs> the classical meditation uh, mm. techniques if you want to do that. Mm. And that's okay. I think that opening up of these dimensions can do something. But finally, like contemplation, I'll use the Christian term, it has little to do with that stuff. It has little to do with um, that kind of psychological experience. It's much deeper thing. It's a, it's a, a confrontation with the living God, and it's it can be experienced like um, you know in some of the Buddhist traditions when there's the student and what's enlightenment? What does it mean? What does it mean? And the master tell me I've been struggling for years, and and then the master holds up a flower, and he gets it. <laughs> you know, is and there's there's stories like that in the Christian tradition too. You know, uh, that to me is a much purer thing than whatever happens, whatever's happening to Pete Townsend through LSD. I think it's pure. Oh yeah, I the, held the flower. I get it. I I get uh, what this Buddhist teaching is. I think that's probably a better way. <laughs> Well, what's the quote that I heard a quote on that? It's like, beware of unearned wisdom, you know, like just getting there right away and that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way. I think that's right. Um, That's right. And, um, you know, life is weird and there's a lot of things that, uh, out here in California, I've met some folks, you know, who are into this more kind of experimental stuff Mm -hmm. and uh, I'm always cautious of it. I I think, again, the glass half full thing, if, if certain techniques are leading you to a deeper level of awareness of spiritual things... Okay. Mm. okay. So that is possible in terms of the church and their stance on psychedelics? Well, no, I wouldn't go that far because I'd be, as you were saying, I'd be very wary of uh, of the physical abuse involved. Mm. If these things are, are pretty dangerous to use, I certainly would never recommend people to use them. Mm. Uh, I would recommend things like these more classical techniques of prayer and meditation. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, you know, the Jesus prayer in our tradition. Do you know about that? The mm. uh, uh, the Jesus prayer is simply, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the whole prayer. But it's repeated over and again, and you breathe in on the first part of the prayer, and you oh, breathe out the second oh, part interesting. of the prayer. There's a, I've got one back in my chapel. It's this uh, rope with these little knots on it. It's called a, I think it's called a shotki. And as you pray it, you just you move the beads or the, the knots. Well, read the, uh, the Way of the Pilgrim, this great book on the Jesus prayer. And it'll talk a lot about what this thing starts doing to you, what this does to your awareness and your consciousness and your life. Fascinating. And it's mm-hmm. like the breathing thing and how it becomes just part of your whole life. I'd recommend that rather than psychedelics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to people, mm-hmm. Something else that's that's kind of growing uh, today is this uh, this idea of open relationships or these 
where, you know, if you love your partner, if you truly love them, then you won't be jealous of them like you own them and you want them to feel pleasure and enjoy themselves with other people. And they make a pretty compelling argument in that regard. And I don't necessarily agree with what they say, but when they say it, it sounds, it can sound good to a lot of people. Like, yeah, I do love my partner. I don't want to be jealous. Like, what do you? Good luck with that. I mean, <laughs> come on. I don't, I don't believe that for a second. I, mean, people, I think the jealousy would kick in in about, about 14 seconds. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, I don't believe that. And I think um, the classical biblical teaching about, about marriage is, is still, I mean, it's the healthiest and the most life-giving form. Mm. And I think playing those games with, with you know, shared partners and stuff, I don't know. I think that's going to be a short road to chaos. Mm. Science, so statistically, you're right, by the way. Science will sh- yeah, actually I, shows that that's... that's I that's think so. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I would never recommend someone down that road. <laughs> now, why can't priests get married? Well, they can. I mean, they, they were for the first oh, thousand I years. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look at um, the fact that St. Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law that oh, Jesus okay. cured. And then for the first thousand years, roughly, the vast majority of priests were married. Uh, there were monastics from the beginning who didn't marry. So monks who left kind of ordinary life, went out of the desert and all that. And that's where the celibate tradition really takes um, its... its um, well, it, The roots are finding in Jesus himself who's celibate. Paul who's celibate. And Jesus says those who can become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom should do so. I mean, mm-hmm. so I, I don't want to just trace to the Desert Fathers. It goes back to Jesus himself as a spiritual path. Uh, now, he didn't. Jesus didn't say, now, all priests must be celibate, because for the first thousand years, they weren't. Most weren't. Um, what happened was a certain stage in the church's history, it was deemed wise that all priests should adopt this monastic uh, uh, practice of celibacy. So that's kind of historically how it, how it unfolded. You know, one thing I do, right? Away, I would lift it right away out of a Christian context and just go around the world. You find celibacy all over the place in spiritual traditions. No one ever, ever asks, like, the Dalai Lama, why? What's this celibacy thing? Mm-hmm. No one ever asked him about that, which I think <laughs> is really interesting. Why not? He's celibate. He's celibate all his life. But somehow it's okay for the Dalai Lama to be celibate. But when priests are celibate, oh, that's kind of weird. Yeah. How about Gandhi, who was a married man, had kids, but at a certain stage of his life, as a spiritual discipline, said, no, I'm now celibate. Mm. Anyone say, hey, Gandhi, what's the matter with you? How come your celibacy thing seems crazy to me? No one ever say anything. It's cool that Gandhi yeah. celibate. Yeah. So my point first there is, is broaden the thing out. It's a worldwide, transcultural, spiritual practice. You know. Mm. Um, so first of all, they don't have to be. But why is there some wisdom to it? This may be another way to get at the question. Why is there some value to a priest being celibate? Um, here's a... Here's a Quick answer, complicated thing. Um, everything in the world is is good, and that's a basic biblical idea, right? From Genesis, that God made everything, even even creepy crawly things, even the you know bugs are good, and God found the whole of it very good, right? So there isn't an ounce of what we call Manichaeism in Christianity, meaning like you know spirits good, matters bad, and that's a really ancient and still enduring idea. But look at Star Wars, you know. Whenever you've got uh, these Manichaean systems of light and dark and all that, none of that in Christianity. Creation's good. Creation's good. Body, good. Sexuality, good. The church has resisted, and it's come up all the time. Look throughout its history. From the beginning to now, the church has resisted any claim that says sexuality is bad, the body's bad. No, no. Now, everything in the world's good, but nothing in the world is God, Right? So there's a great kind of yes and no at the heart of biblical spirituality. Yes to the world in its goodness. No to the world as a substitute for God, right? And there's our old thing we talked about a while ago. Is we tend to say, oh, you know, wealth, that's God. Uh, pleasure, that's God. Power, that's God. Honor. No, no. None of those things is God. Therefore, it's a spiritual practice from, the, from ancient times that all these things have to be uh, detached. We have to be detached from all these things. We, they're good, but they're not God. <laughs> so we affirm them and we deny them. You know what I'm saying? We deny their ultimacy. Mm. To keep from the temptation, is that the idea? Right. And so, so practices like fasting, which again can be found across the world in all the great spiritual traditions, is a way of saying physical pleasure is not God. So man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is not down on food, but he's saying food isn't God, right? 
all these kingdoms I'll give you if you but bow down and worship me. You know, be gone, Satan. What's he saying is, is power, worldly power, isn't God. And so he's, he's detached from it. Um, so, now celibacy. Uh, married life, children, sexuality, body, family, good. Yep, all of it. Great. Is it God? No, none of it's God. And therefore, spiritual people from time immemorial and across the culture, some of them, have opted to say, I'm going to fast from these things as a sign of detachment. Now, for myself, but also for the wider world, Hmm. when people would see someone living that way, they'd say, wow, that's weird. See, that's good. That's a good thing. That's part of the purpose of it. Wow, that's weird. How, how, How could you live that way? What is that all about? It's it's like a it's a wake up call to say, yeah, this good thing is not ultimate, you know. So that's how it comes into the spiritual tradition. Um, and then at a certain stage, around the in the eleventh uh, and twelfth century, the church decided as a legal thing that they would make this this the practice of all priests in its tradition. Now, could that change? Yeah, it could. It's not essentially tied to the priesthood. Okay. But um, th- that's, I think, the spiritual value of mm-hmm. something like celibacy. Um, I mean, you guys involved with fitness, you know all about this stuff, too, about oh, yeah. all sorts of things that you have to say no to. Absolutely. Right? For the great yes that you want to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, you say no for the sake of a greater yes. And that's a way to, to get at it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Um, you, you, you mentioned a couple things about why we don't criticize other people or question other people for doing the same things. Why is it, seems, why is it so easy to... It feels like it's open season on Christianity, but tell me. But about nobody it. else. <laughs> you, me if you it. say anything about anybody else or criticize anyone else, yeah, right um, you're you're. I mean, you're chastised. I mean, if I say, you know, oh, you know, Saudi Arabia just allowed women to drive. I mean, that's a very oppressive religion towards women in, in the way it's expressed in that country or whatever. You know, I'm Islamophobic. Yeah. But people can say whatever they want about Christianity. Mm. I always thought that was, even when I was an atheist, I thought that was yeah. very inconsistent. Why mm-hmm. is it like that? Yeah, it's a good question. First of all, you're right. It's the correct observation. I see it all the time, you know, and the, and the deep unfairness of it. Uh, oh, because I guess, you know, we're the dominant, we're seen as the dominant religion. Mm. And That's so, why everybody hates the Yankees, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So you're, and, and especially the Catholic Church is, you know, the, the biggest kind of single denomination around. So I suppose that's part of it. Um, and just that instinct of the grass is greener, or the instinct of like, yeah, I'm going to go after my own people. You know, mm. I suppose that's part of it. But I think you're right in in scoring it as as deeply unfair. You know, because um, a lot of things that people don't like about Christianity, you'll find the other religions too if you look hard enough. They're all a lot of them are there. So why are we being picked on? Uh, I suppose our our dominant position culturally. But see, that's boy, that's shifting though. In my mm. lifetime, that shifted a lot. Mm-hmm. From the time I was a kid. To now, that shifted a lot. I don't know if we can say as readily, you know, oh, yeah, we're a Christian country or a biblical yeah. country. I think part of it might also be that that Christianity allows for that to happen because they yeah. value freedom. Whereas well, if you're, if God, you know, if you're in an Islamic country and you just draw a picture of right. the Prophet Muhammad, you could be killed. Yeah, and um, it, it's a good point you raise. And and uh, N. T. Wright, one of my favorite theologians, made the point that. Uh, let's see, where is it in this room? We have a crucifix up. But um, how weird, in a way, that what we we boldly hold up, we don't hide it, we boldly hold it up, is is our founder being mocked right. publicly. Mm. Yeah, that's the cross. That's our symbol. Yeah. Yeah. Is is so, like, mocking Jesus, well, well it's off you go. They can't do anything worse than what they did. And in fact, we're going to, there's the there's cross over there. We're going to hold it up. There's this this mocked, humiliated, spat upon, crucified criminal left to die. Yep, there he is, everybody. Hey, look, look. So this whole thing about, oh, you couldn't possibly say something negative about Jesus. Off you go. <laughs> we specialize in it. So there, there is something, uh, but that's not just a trivial observation. There's something really profound about that, mm. that, that we hold up. Like Paul says, I preach one thing, Christ and him crucified. And in his time, see, we say, oh yeah, Christ crucified, that's great. Oh, he's savior of the world. But your first century... <laughs> Crucified? What are you talking about? Is it you're you're proclaiming someone crucified? Are you out of your mind? Are you nuts? Hence riots, right? Uh, to recover that space is really good for us to go back to early Christianity. Why was this proclamation so weird? And it was. It was deeply, deeply weird because he's holding up this this hopelessly 
uh, persecuted and executed criminal. But that's Christianity. God. Boom, to get that. And I think that's part of our evangelical call today. Mm. Uh, what do you think the future of Christianity, how, how do you think that's going to look? And what are the biggest challenges today that you guys have to contend with? Yeah, good. Um, well, it's the, the in the West anyway, I'll speak about that, is, is the growing secularism of, of the culture. That's a huge challenge. We're not, uh, go back to the Reformation time, it was a, a, a split within Christianity. It was a division among Christians. That's not the major issue now. It's it's a, a culture becoming um, uh, increasingly aggressive toward the whole idea of God. So I, I, I agree with um, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, who said a long time ago, it's always about God. That that's our question, to bring the question of God forward in a compelling way. That's our biggest challenge. You can look at, you know, like within the Catholic Church, this this whole sex abuse thing, which we have got to get a handle on, you know. But I think more broadly, it's it's a question of God. Scientism, materialism, the, the the advance of a secular culture, all that, that's what we're facing. So, you know, we got a big fight. Mm. Well, I want to respect your time. I could literally yeah. sit here and talk to you. I know. <laughs> I know. Another I three hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I really much. appreciate you doing this. And, and like I said, the way I think you're doing it is um, absolutely brilliant. I think if the church is going to reach younger generations today, it's got to be through the, I guess you got to, what is it? Join, you, you got to join them. You can't, if you can't fight them, join them type of deal. Use their yeah. tools and. Oh, no, I agree with that. Yeah. As, as Paul used the Roman roads of his time, that was a, a, <laughs> a tool, if you want. Um, and the printing press later on, and Fulton Sheen used the radio and TV, mm -hmm. and absolutely, we should use it. I also uh, appreciate your willingness to answer difficult questions. A lot of your videos, you will answer very mm -hmm. direct, very difficult questions. And um, I know you've been open to debating very prominent atheists, and I hope that happens. I would love to see that yeah. discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm open to it. Um, I think that is that's the the challenge of our time. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming thank on. Thank you guys. Yeah. I appreciate it very thank much. You. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, and Maps Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>